Hello everyone, I hope you're all well. It's finally time for me to sit down and talk through some of the books I read in 2023. And yes, I'm very aware it is February, so pretty late, but I thought better late than never. 2023 is actually one of the best reading years I've had in a long time. I read more books in 2023 than I did, um, in fact, for like, since university. And is there a correlation between kind of me filming even less videos and reading more? Probably, but let's not let's not talk about that now as I'm here uh, with you in this moment. Um, but I did have a great reading year and I think I really embraced just reading for pleasure and reading, you know, my cosy mysteries, but then also reading a lot of history books, which brings me a lot of joy. And when I look back at it, yes, it was great quantity wise. And I finally hit a reading goal, which I've never hit before. I just I always set kind of little goals just for myself and I never hit them. Um, or at the end of the year, I kind of then amend the goal to make me hit them, which I don't think is quite how goal setting is supposed to work. It was really good quantity wise but also just quality. I read a lot of books that I know kind of became all time favourites this year which is exactly what I think I want for all my reading years and there were lots of books that brought me a lot of pleasure from you know rereading on favourites and I, yeah the quality was just really really high um, and I thought I would talk about my kind of top reads of 2023 via the book postscript tag because I felt like it was a little bit more of an interesting way for me to sit and talk about some of the reads that I found most enjoyable or were slightly different this year. For this video I had to whip out my old book journal. This is how you know I don't read that many books a year because I think my mum bought this for me in 2010, 2009. I think I actually started filling it out in 2010. So this has had way over a decade's worth of reading and it still haven't quite, haven't quite kind of, it's not finished yet. So um, my mum brought me this and I just love it. Um, and I kind of feel very sentimental about it, even though the elastic's actually gone and my cat has now chewed the little bookmark thing. But anyway, I'm just gonna have to remind myself of what I actually have read. One thing about having a book journal that, by the way, I never write anything more. I think a few people have asked me about how I document my reading. I literally just write the title and I have a key. So like I style my favorite books and I mark their rereads or classics and I kind of then look at the, my stats of the year. But I no longer chart my reading on the internet because I just started finding it a little bit stressful. Um, and I just kind of, I whenever I did have a good read or story graph, I kept it private anyway. And I was like, well, if I'm gonna keep it private and I still use this book journal, I might as well just, just use this. Um, but one thing that is kind of scary when you look back at all the years you've been reading is just my handwriting <laughs> over the years. I think my handwriting has actually gotten worse. I've never had good handwriting, um, but it, you know, it's so rare that you actually get faced with your kind of younger self um, in handwriting. And I was just looking back at memories, but I look at this pretty much every week, so. Anyway, I'll actually tell you about my favourite books or my top books of 2023, shall I? I really should have prepped the video because here I am with the questions and my, my book journal. The first question is the longest book you read this year and the book that took you the longest to finish. So, I think for me, in fact no, let me go back and actually get the books. This is really silly, if you wonder how boring it would be if I just sat here and was like, the second question is, oh, the answer is this, it just be, anyway, let me, let me actually go and find the books. What am I doing? How long have I been doing this? I don't deserve, I don't deserve to be here. Um, thank you for being here, by the way, it actually brings me a lot of joy, but let me go and find the books. Now I can't even remember the question. So, it's the longest book you read this year and the book that you took you the longest to finish. So, I think these two books are actually the same size of each other. So the paperback I have of the hardback is the same, around the same size, or slightly less than the books, but they're also... Oh my goodness, this is so chaotic. So let me let me start again. The book that took me the longest to finish was um, what is Marie Antoinette by Antonia Fraser. This is a reread for me. Um, I love Marie Antoinette. Whenever I look at my love of history, it's always which kind of women in history have the most, especially royal women, and have like the most tragic ends. And then you'll know you'll be. Uh, you'll find me there kind of reading about them. I read it when I was pretty young, in fact I think I first read it in 2009 and luckily I can check my book journal for that because I have it handy. Um, but I wanted to reread it because I was watching, or wanting to watch the TV series that was on. I actually never finished watching that series so I should probably go and do that but I did finish rereading this and with this reread I did kind of part audio, part um, like physically reading the, the book um, and I have it in paperback and in this hardback because I found this hardback at a really lovely charity shop locally to me and I just thought it's so beautiful it has to come home. In general if you're looking for a good historical biography of anyone Antonia Rosa is always such a good one to go to and I love um, her biography of Mary Antoinette so this is really enjoyable but because I kind of it was going in between listening to the audiobook and then reading I just it took me longer to finish because it's quite chunky about how long is this so I think the paperback comes out as about 560 pages. 
and this one, I'm not including all the, the bibliography. Ugh, again, why am I not prepared? I'm so sorry for this chaos. 429, this one. Oh, so it's actually not as... Oh, of course, it's a hardback, so the paperback is about 560, I think. And then the longest book I read this year was The Strangest Family by Janice Hadlow, The Private Lives of George Ford, Queen Charlotte and the Hanoverians. And I think, in fact, not I think, this was my favourite read of 2023. I fucking loved it. It was a joy. Um, obviously, I loved the 18th century. I loved the Georgian era. The, I there was so much in here that I just I didn't know and I literally went away and read the bibliography and then went and ordered way more books to read and that's exactly what I want from a really good history book is just to kind of have that spark lit inside my soul and get that excitement and then always want to go and learn more and that's exactly what this did. This book is, drumroll again please, um, also you know I love it so I know this people will hate, but when I really love a book, I dog ear. Um, and so there are so many things I just dog ear here, thinking like, I really want to remember this fact, or I want to write an essay on this, and this would be really interesting to study, because that's how I am. I'm still pretending I'm in academia. So it is 600 and... Oh, again, you're spending time with clicking pages, not the way you thought you'd spend an evening. 617, so... Normally, I do love a chunky book, so 617, I think, is a perfectly acceptable book for a history book, kind of length to be, um, and I do quite like chunky books, and so I think this is probably shorter than the other years I've done, but so recommended, and even though if it feels long and it feels chunky, if you love the Georgian era, the Regency era, that whole, the whole thing, you will really enjoy it. Janice Hadlow is also the author of The Other Bennett Sister, which I haven't yet read, but after reading this, I obviously want to read it. And so I think if you have read that book and you just enjoyed the way she writes in general, read this and you know that so many of the little things she left in the novel are from her own research, which I really love, especially when writers go on to write historical fiction. And there were so many elements where actually she does mention Mary Bennett in this that I was like, ah, oh, she's doing her research here. Like she's already maybe planning and plotting that novel. So it was just brilliant. The next prompt is a book you read that is outside your comfort zone. And I picked Animal Farm by George Orwell. And this may not seem like a book that's outside of my comfort zone, and it's not really. But it's been a long time since I read a 20th century classic, or in fact read a George Orwell novel. I haven't read George Orwell since being at university, and I also have a bit of a an iffy relationship with him in the way that I love Down Out in Paris and London, but really hate 1984. But Animal Farm is my best friend's novel, and for years we've had an ongoing thing that I would read Animal Farm and she would read Mrs. Stanway, and I don't think she yet delivered on Mrs. Stanway, which I don't really hold against her because I do feel like I don't want anyone to read Virginia Woolf unless they really want to because I feel like it makes Virginia Woolf a harder writer to approach potentially. Um, but I did read her favourite novel and I loved it. Um, it was way more funny than I thought it was going to be. It feels almost insulting to George Orwell to say that I wasn't expecting it to be as good as this. But I think the reason it's outside my comfort zone is because I, as soon as someone tells me to read a book, except in a university setting because I love academic validation, I don't want to read it. I have no interest. You told me to read a book, I don't want to read it. And I'm aware that's probably what I'm doing to Ariel with Mrs. Downway. But as soon as there's that pressure, I just want to, I, it, I want to kind of throw it out the window. I just don't want to touch it. And so for me to read a book that was so specifically recommended to me um, by her um, in nearly every conversation we have, and then to love it is something really special. And I do think there is something special about reading a book that you know someone else loves. And I think if you have someone who's really close to you and that you love, always ask them what their favourite song is, their film is, because, you know, when you don't see them or, you know, when someone passed away, whatever the horrible thing is, you just don't always realise how much you then rely on those things that, you know, they love so much. And so I'm glad I had this experience. Making it sound like Ariel's dead, she's very much alive and has recently bought a book truck, so she's absolutely fine, but I'm really glad to have read this novel. The next question is, how many books did you reread in 2023? And thanks to my handy tally in my journal, um, I reread seven books in 2023, which is actually quite a lot, probably more than normal. But interestingly, I didn't reread two of the books that I normally reread each year, which is Mrs. Dalloway and Wuthering Heights, which was quite interesting. Wuthering Heights, I'm waiting until I'm back in Yorkshire so I can kind of have a bunting moment. Mrs. Dalloway, I did reread to the lighthouse, not to the lighthouse. Um, I was going to reread to the lighthouse and then I just never did. What happened to that? Um, but I did. Well, I guess I read kind of half it. I just never finished it. That's disappointing. I'll do that next. This is how my brain works. Um, but I did reread um, A Room of One's Own, which I think is going to be 
one of my answers to these questions, but I can't remember what the questions are. Um, but yeah, so I, yeah, what was I saying? So yeah, I read seven, um, we read seven novels and they were all favourites as well. Apart from one, which was, I love, sorry, it's so chaotic. I did reread um, Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid, which is the book I didn't really like originally, but then went on to re really enjoy reading. The same actually with Sense and Sensibility. So that was the Jane Austen that I actually kind of struggled with most, and I'd actually say it's probably one of my least favourites. Reread it again, it's now one of my favourites, or at least kind of further up in my kind of um, ranking of, of Jane Austen novels. Um, but yeah, seven is the actual answer, and I'm going to stop speaking. So out of all of the books I reread in 2023, two definitely kind of stick out, um, and are the other ones I mentioned. Um, the one book I did mention is A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf, and I actually reread this by listening to it um, as an audiobook, which I've never done before, and it's really enjoyable. And I just put Virginia Woolf in my ears and just went for a walk around London, and I just, you know, everything felt right and good kind of in the world, um, and I really enjoyed reading it. But my top reread of 2023 has to be Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. I cannot tell you how much joy rereading this book brought to me. It really made me just fall in love again with Jane Austen, not that I ever fall out of love with Jane Austen, but just made me realise this is why I'm alive. You know, when you have one of those moments and you're like, this is it, guys, this is the one. I, it was joyous, um, it was funny, um, her characters are so brilliantly portrayed and they're so individual to themselves and there are so many elements that just make it I think the perfect novel and I really will stand by that. I think it is a masterpiece and one of the best books ever written. If you haven't read Pride and Prejudice, this is your moment. Even though I know it's one of those books that everyone says is their favourite book, there is such a reason for that and it just yeah it's brilliant um and it was again a joyous experience to kind of return to that world i don't think reading a book has ever made me feel as happy as rereading pride and prejudice does and what i wouldn't give to experience that for the first time i first read pride and prejudice when i was a very young teenager and loved it and i hadn't actually reread it since then and there's always a worry isn't there that you just won't enjoy a book as much as you did especially when it has such a big impact on you. It's the reason I still haven't reread Jane Eyre, like I'm scared. And so going back to Pride and Prejudice felt like a bit of a risk, strangely, but um, it was just an incredible experience. The next question is, a book you read for the first time in 2023 and look forward to rereading in the future? And as my answer, I actually have three Agatha Christie novels. And I know you might think, Agatha Christie, murder mystery, when you know who's done it, what's the joy in reading it? And I thought exactly the same thing. My grandma, um, who loved Agatha Christie, which I think she was definitely like her favourite novelist, she basically would just like, I'd take her to the library and she'd get a stack of books and she'd come home and then she'd just start rereading the Agatha Christie that she's already read a million times. And I think she would just like start, finish all of them and then go back to the beginning, start again. Like she just loved Agatha Christie. I think actually what my one regret is not knowing what her favourite Agatha Christie was. Um, so again, always ask people what their favourite books are. But actually since getting into Agatha Christie at the end of last year and really having a 2023 dedicated to reading lots of Agatha Christie novels, I realised that actually as soon as you know who did it, like the, the end, I'm like, okay, now I'm rethinking the whole thing. I want to know how she's plotted this, like how this has been crafted, are there any clues I could have picked up on, and that whole game. So even though you think it's just there's there's one game and the game is to find out who is the end, I feel like there's definitely two. There's then the rereading to try and work it out with her, or like see how she's really cleverly plotted the novel. The first two books I'll show you, I think are my two favourite Agatha Christie novels I've read thus far. And the first one is The Merger of Roger Ackroyd. And if you have read this and know the plot twist, I think you know why this book has made it here because I just thought it was genius, the whole thing, I just thought it was so cleverly done um, and I definitely need to go back and reread the whole thing to see how this narrative was created. The next one was actually a bit of a surprising one because I didn't think it was going to be a massive favourite until we kind of got to the end and I just loved the entire thing and it is The Murder at the Vicarage, so it's the first Marple book. So last year I started reading Poirot, or not last year, the year before that, I started reading Poirot. 2023 is really dedicated to reading Poirot books and then I started Miss Marple and Ancestor first one, 
I loved it. And you know it's a good like, Agatha Christie novel where you kind of get to the end and I'm literally screaming and reading bits to bed out loud and just experiencing the whole like realisation of what she's been able to trick me into. Um, and I just thought it was incredible and I'm really excited to read more Marple. Um, but I will definitely be rereading these to try and work work them out from the other, the other end, the other perspective. The other Agatha Christie I want to show with you was Hercule Poirot's Christmas. Now I take after my mum in the way that I love a seasonal read and in fact, I haven't really ever read a book specifically at Christmas every year. My mum reads A Christmas Carol every year and I've always wanted that. And when I read this, not only did I just think it was a cracking read, like I think it's actually one of Agatha Christie's stronger prose that I've read so far and I've really enjoyed it. But the way it is told, literally, it is done kind of each chapter is a different date and you can kind of, the way I read it was I read that section on that date so I was really kind of immersed in this Agatha Christie novel and I love doing that um, and because of that it made even more atmospheric, even more me a part of the novel and kind of you know also helping Poirot solve this case. The twist at the end I also really enjoyed. I think if you like Murder of Roger Ackroyd and that twist you'd probably enjoy the twist of this one too. Then we're on to favourite short story or novella that I read in 2023. I don't really read any short stories, I only tend to read novellas, so if you do have any short story recommendations please let me know. But once again I've picked more than one book for this. Um, I'll start with Sanditon because I talked about that most recently. Sanditon I guess kind of has to count as a novella because it's not finished, but I really enjoyed reading it and that again I think I said this before but I put off reading the Sanditon and the Watsons because they were unfinished and I kind of didn't want to read anything that I felt like Jane Austen didn't want me to read. Um, but I really enjoyed it and I was very sad because I felt like Sanditon was the novel that I really wanted to be finished and really was enjoying the characters and the world building and that kind of thing. Um, and I'm, so I'm glad I finally read it. A novella that I loved and would recommend and which just really made me think about a lot of things including um, how kind of a novel is crafted is Claire Keegan's um, Small Things Like These which I think lots of people have loved. It is so deserving of all of the acclaim and the praise because it is incredible um, and it just really made me stop for a bit and just think about it. And it was interesting to see how other people responded to the ending because I felt like when I was responding to the ending I was actually feeling as if it was like a kind of a, a downfall, you know, like I felt like it was a, a thing of destruction. And so to have people respond really differently to a novel and some people to see it hopeful and think that it's happy ending, whereas I was like, oh God, oh, this shit's going to hit the fan right now. Um, and that was interesting when it is so short that you can have such big discussions. And I like a book that really makes people talk and discuss it. And that's exactly what this book did. It's also just incredibly beautiful and yeah, so well, well worth a read. The next two questions I find really interesting because they're all about appeal and kind of mass appeal and specialised appeal. And I find it interesting kind of thinking about what I would say for like my specialised appeal because I'm speaking to people who subscribe to me or, you know, are on booktube or watch videos about books even if you're not subscribed. If you aren't subscribed, please do. Um, but when I was thinking about it, I was like, all of these books I know are linked to the niche that is my channel or the things that I'm interested in. So like the Georgian era, the Tudors, etc. Um, so it is interesting. So if I pulled a random person off the street, the book that I've picked would definitely be, be like a special interest and not necessarily a book you pick up off the shelf. So for Mass Appeal, I picked Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid because I reread it this year and just really loved it. Um, I thought it was such like an enjoyable reading experience. I was completely immersed in it. I also reread it at the time of the adaptation. I thought the adaptation was also so good. Another book for Mass Appeal is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens and I just realised I really should have put this as one of my favourite novellas I read uh, in 2023. Um, again, this was a reread for me, but I really, really loved it. Um, I had kind of forgotten just how good Dickens is, and Ben will not like me saying that because he hates Dickens, but really enjoyable, and I think it's probably one of the most accessible classics you can read. Um, the same with Pride and Prejudice, I feel like if I make a list of kind of classics that are really accessible to people, I feel like, you know, Pride and Prejudice and uh, Christmas Carol probably kind of always two of my kind of top recommendations, obviously perfect for Christmas, um, and I feel like a lot of people will just find their way to this novel during that kind of season so they're my recommendations. For a book with a more specialised appeal I've picked Thomas Cromwell by Tracy Borman and I'm going to preface this by saying I'm very aware this is like popular history, like true popular history and The Tudors itself is you know a time period in which so many people are interested partly because of you know adaptations and TV series and also just because I think so many of us get taught it in schools. My answer to this question is really just for all the geeks out there because I think it takes a particular type of person to read Wolf Hall or to 
be interested in the, the era to read one book specifically just about Thomas Cromwell um, because he's such a polarising figure and I feel like, you know, a book about the Six Wives of Henry VIII or a book about Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, for example, I, do, I think would have less specialised appeal. But because of who Thomas Cromwell is, I feel like this is one for the nerds kind of thing. Um, I love Thomas Cromwell. Um, he's one of my favourite historical figures, um, which is a really interesting thing for someone whose favourite wife is probably Anne Boleyn to say. But I just find him so fascinating and I really loved this biography too. Even though I'd say this is a really accessible piece of popular history, I still think Thomas Cromwell is slightly, slightly more specialised. The last question is a bit more about me reflecting on my year as kind of a bookish content creator. And one thing I'll say is that even though at the beginning, as I said, I've read more books this year because I think I was also making less videos and various things, I think reflecting on that, I'm just really grateful that you were all here because I dip in into YouTube and I've been doing it now. This channel has been around for 12 years. I think that means it's a total of like 14 years on booktube I think and it's it's quite a long time. Like it's been the longest hobby I've ever really kept up I guess apart from reading history and those kind of things. Um, but I'm really grateful that so many of you have been here for a long time and I'm also really grateful that people still find my videos. Like I get comments from people saying oh my goodness I just found this video and and that means so much to me. So I think my main reflection is that I'm really glad that you're here in the same way that I'm glad that you're now at the kind of the end of this video with me. In terms of videos I made I really liked the videos I did at Jane Austen's house um, and when I was my time in Chawton and I had just a really great year Jane Austen wise anyway but I did really like those videos. I also I think this is not even bookish related but um, in 2020 I started back my what I call my snapshot video so like my always um, home movie style videos of me just documenting each season documenting my life and I have done a full year of those and that made me really happy because they're the videos I like to look back on and that I only do them really for me because I do rewatch them a lot and especially as I knew it was going to be my last kind of while in London that's why I wanted to kind of restart them and I did and I really like the way they came out and I'm proud of them just personally for me. In other bookish things I also got a promotion in 2023. I became the head of marketing at the publishing company I work for uh, which was just a massive career goal of mine and to have to have achieved that in 2023 I'm yeah still really proud of. I don't really talk about my career as much as I used to but I think that's probably just because I'm working all the time um, but that's the one thing with making less videos. Um, my life is so bookish all the time because I'm paid to be bookish. Um, I'm paid to, to do things with books and to read books and to do you know market them um, and so even when I'm not making videos I'm still so involved in the bookish world um, that I do take a break from making videos and take a break from reading because even though I've read more books, you know, in 2023, um, because my life is, is is books, really, which is also one reason why I do so much of a history stuff in my spare time, because the, all of the other time is books for me and literature. But yeah, that was a massive kind of goal for me and a really proud moment for me in 2023. So that is my postscript book tag. I really hope you enjoyed listening to me talk about some of the books I read in 2023, and I hope I've ever given you some recommendations um, for books that you would want to read in 2024. Uh, but it's also just really made me think about what I actually plan on reading in 2024, because I don't ever really plan what I'm going to read. So I might have to think about that now, um, because 2023 was such a brilliant kind of bookish year for me. As I said earlier, thank you so much for watching and for being with me on my channel, for subscribing, for commenting. It all means so much, especially the commenting. And I'm really glad you're here with me. And if you are here, at the end of the video please leave a book emoji of your choice i love when i see all my comments kind of flurry with with emoji so thank you um i'm gonna leave you now but um i hope you've enjoyed the video as i've already said um and i'll be back soon uh, with, uh, hopefully with another bookish video bye